in the interest of time, I think that I would merely suggest that you remember the masterful way in which Dr. McCutcheon extended greetings to various parts of the audience. And I merely say, thank you, Dr. McCutcheon. I add you to that group, and that will make it complete so far as I'm concerned. Oklahoma had been a thriving, thriving state long before it achieved real statehood in 1970. I say that because uh, when my people came to Oklahoma, some years before that, I had the pleasure of saying to the president of the University of Oklahoma when he conferred on me an honorary degree some years ago and described me as a Sooner, uh, I pointed out that uh, my people were here long before the Sooners got here. <laughs> They came in 1834 uh, yeah. when uh, Andrew Jackson drove the Indians and their compatriots out of Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana and sent them across the Mississippi River into the area known as the Choctaw Nation and the Indian Territory. And Oklahoma began to thrive then long before it was a state. Indeed, it was doing so well that, as far as my own family was concerned, my father, born in the Choctaw Nation in 1879, had gone to the Dawes Academy and then went away to college in Tennessee. That institution of higher learning was Roger Williams University in Nashville. And from there, he went on to Atlanta Baptist College, now Morehouse College. Upon returning to his native territory, he was one of the many so-called freedmen who objected strenuously to the harsh, unequivocal racial segregation provisions in the state constitution of 1907. Once the state was established, subsequent laws designed to perfect the system of total segregation were enacted by the state legislature. A notable example of such efforts to reach perfection must have taxed the ingenuity or even of even the most extreme bigots. And the one that reached the highest or the lowest point, depending upon your own perspective, was a law that required separate telephone booths for white and black users. <laughs> By the time that my father completed his formal education, he returned to Oklahoma, settled in the formal study of law through correspondence courses, and had returned east to marry his college sweetheart, Molly Lee Parker from West Tennessee. They then settled in Ardmore, where he began the practice of law, having passed the Oklahoma Bar examina Examination in 1908. His wife, an astonishingly gifted person, worked as a milliner and seamstress until she found employment as an elementary school teacher. With two children already in tow, Mozella and B.C. Jr., they decided to cast their lot with the old black unincorporated town of Rennesville, Oklahoma, situated in McIntosh County, about 70 miles south of Tulsa. It soon became apparent that Rennesville provided few opportunities that they diligently sought. The high school was so weak that they bundled off their two older children to boarding school in Tennessee. And by that time, two younger children had been born in Rennesville, Aunt Harriet and myself. The two of us had no serious objections to the tiny community. There seemed to be sufficient play and playmates for the two of us. And school was surely exciting, especially since sitting in the back of my mother's schoolroom, I learned to read and write when I was three years old. You see, there are some advantages of not having a daycare center in the community. <laughs> but the good life had its limits, for there was not much light after sunset. And the well water, although healthy and taste, healthful and tasty, was hard for a five and six year old to pull up from what seemed to be a bottomless pit, which was a well. <laughs> but that was soon in. My parents finally concluded that the village, even with its attractions, was not a viable place either for us to make a living or to him to within the raise a family. Consequently, my father would move to the fabled Tulsa city of Tulsa as soon as possible and he would have us join us there shortly thereafter. 
In a matter of weeks, he had established himself in Tulsa. His law practice grew rapidly, and he seemed to fill several voids in leadership that the black community needed. He would, indeed, be able to have us join him within a matter of months, then weeks, then days. Soon, in early June 1921, we would be on our way to T-Town. I was six years old, but I can remember it as though it were yesterday. We looked forward to that day in early June when we would make our move from Rennesville to Tulsa. My father's practice was by, was by that time so lucrative that he was able to find a place for us to live. And as soon as we were out of school, and as soon as my mother had concluded her school as a, te as a teacher, we were out of there and on our way to the big city. We packed our things to be ready for my father to come to get us. We waited and we waited. And there was no word. Then we waited some more. And there was no word. Then we learned from a news account in the Muskogee Daily Phoenix that was dropped off in Rennesville by the Frisco Railroad that there had been a race ride in Tulsa with an undetermined number of casualties. I knew from my mother's countenance that the news was not good. We waited for what seemed to be an eternity. But late I learned that it was perhaps six or seven or eight days. And then we got a letter from my father. He said that he was doing all right, that he had survived, that he was not injured in the ride at all, but that he had stepped out to see what was going on, and he was seized and taken into custody. And the home that he secured for us was in ashes. And everything he lost was in that home. Nothing else at all that he had. And he had no idea then when we would be moving. So we slowly unpacked our things and settled down for the long wait. He said he was, he was terribly busy representing clients in lawsuits against the city and against the insurance companies but he would come as soon as he could. That was, an, that was another eternity, especially for a six-year-old longing for his daddy. But time had a way of passing, even for a six-year-old. And in due course, perhaps a few weeks, my father returned to Rentersville and gave us a first-hand account of the ride. Later, he would tell about it in his autobiography, My Life at an Era, in language more vivid than any that I could summon. For well, anyone who cares to read it, I recommend it highly. He wrote it, I did not, I merely edited it. Still another eternity. Children have a way of enduring an eternity after another, one eternity after another. That eternity was four and a half years to be exact, and we would then move from Rennesville to Tulsa. If it is impossible to calculate the damage that was done to our family to be kept apart for four years instead of four months, I think that it would not be possible for me to measure it. For in those four years, I was denied the presence, the mentoring, and indeed the discipline that my father could have given me in those critically important years between six and 10 years of age. Indeed, for all that time, we had only a single parent, as wonderful as my mother was. And my sister and I were essentially latchkey children who went home from school to an empty house to perform a list of chores that my mother had laid out before she arrived from her school duties. My father came as often as he could, once every month or so, but that was no substitute for the closely knit nuclear family that we all desired. Meanwhile, my father was busy trying to get ride relief for his clients, but that was next to impossible. So far, as the records show, no insurance company paid anything to any African American, the claims that they submitted. Only whites who owned property in the so-called black section of town received payments from insurance companies for any harm they sustained through wire, fire and water damage during the ride. My father had better luck in his case against the city of Tulsa. The council had passed an ordinance forbidding the construction of buildings that were not fireproof. The ordinance was challenged by one of my father's clients, Joe Locker, when the case reached the Oklahoma Supreme Court, 
the state's highest judicial, judicial body declared the Tulsa ordinance unconstitutional. And black citizens could continue to build, as my father had suggested, with anything that they had, including orange crates. Finally, the time arrived, four and a half years following the riot, when we were able to move from Rennesville to Tulsa. There we were, facing the fulfillment of a dream that we had harbored for so many years. There we were, a, fi a family finally united after an eternity of separation. There we were, at long last in the big city with its gleaming lights, its bustling streets, yes, even its running water that I had never experienced before. What an experience, and what sights. I was especially intrigued by the half-completed buildings, including this one, especially the churches. After four years, they had not risen above the basement. Even then, at 10 years of age, I wondered what kind of people would set the torch to a church, and in this case, all the churches in the black part of town. What had happened to Christian brotherhood, or indeed any kind of brotherhood, that would inspire such hatred, such animosity among any people? The church we attended, Christ Temple on Franklin Place, conducted all of its activities in the basement. I would not see so many half-completed structures again until I visited London in 1951, six years after the end of World War II, and saw how the German Blitzkrieg had reduced much of that great city to rubble and ashes. Black Tulsa, Tulsans had picked themselves up, dusted themselves off, and had begun to build back, even as the smoldering rubble that was North Tulsa had not yet cooled off. Writing in the Crisis Magazine after visiting Tulsa during the meeting of the National Negro Business League in 1925, Dr. W.B. Du Bois described Black City, Black Tulsa as a city of grit. He wrote admiringly of Tulsa's African-American community that had made such a miraculous comeback in a short period of four years. He, saw merely, he merely saw the grit and determination and resolve that had been characteristic of Tulsa's black community from the beginning. And we would see that grit, that resolve, again and again in the years that followed. 